Our guest today is Mick Waters. He spent all his working life in education as a teacher, then a head teacher. He was chief advisor for Birmingham Local Authority and then chief education officer in Manchester. He's now director of curriculum at the Qualifications and Curriculum Authority. Mick, welcome. Thank you. Interestingly, you've worked in both Birmingham and Manchester at a time of great change for those cities. And I think it's fair to say that probably both those cities put education, if not at the centre of that regeneration, they acknowledged that it played a huge part. What was that experience like being in big Victorian cities at that time of regeneration and having a key part to play in education? Well, Birmingham and Manchester are amazing cities and to be there as they pick themselves up from the doldrums of post-war uh, difficulties was absolutely brilliant. But I think some of the work that's taken place in the last 10 years where there's a recognition that uh, we've all got to gather around youngsters and fit them for the future, uh, I think that's been the best period, really. Yeah, and that links us quite nicely to the national curriculum, I suppose, because <laughs> the national curriculum has been one of those things that I suppose you could say has cemented the education mm. system together. Is it important in cementing the nation together? Is, it, is the national curriculum that big a thing? Mm. I think the phrase is lovely, cementing the nation together, because I would like to think that the curriculum was something that we, we treasured as a nation and we, we, we saw as really precious for children so that uh, we could all look at children in our country and say, isn't it wonderful what we've done for them mm. in their early years? And that we'd have a pride in what we were offering. Now, since the national curriculum was invented in the late 80s, right. there's been this endless squabbling by the adults. And so if you're a child, particularly a teenager, you must listen to some of this mm. and wonder, well, can't they agree on what I should learn about? Mm. And can't they be proud of it? And shouldn't we all sort of fight together to make it something really precious? I often think that if the national curriculum was a, <laughs> a child, it would be... Uh, you know, struggling a bit. Taken into care if you yeah, looked after a child. Yeah, you know, employers think it doesn't work, parents yeah. can't understand it, teachers think it's too big for itself. Uh, I think it's a, a challenge, I think the challenge is to try and encourage those people that are interested, which is pretty well everybody, to recognise that uh, we've got to get down to, first of all, what's really important, what's the purpose of the curriculum. Do you think, just stop at that, because that's, that's interesting, do you think, if we look at that, what the purpose of a curriculum should be, do you think, mm. as a nation, we'd more or less get unanimity on that? Well, does, the, does the difference yeah, of opinion yeah. start when you're talking about yeah, We've how done to some work it? over the last 18 months asking uh, a wide range of people what they think the aim should be for learning in our schools. And we've asked thousands of people and got millions of words in response. And it all boils down to three key aims that I know this is just labels and behind yeah. that are thousands of words, but people want young people to be confident as individuals, successful as learners, and responsible as citizens. And that's key within the curriculum reform we're trying to develop at secondary stage. Okay, just before we move on to look at the present changes that are being proposed by QCA, do you think the curriculum has changed a lot since the introduction of the national curriculum in the 80s? Or has it been fiddling? <laughs> fiddling at the edges or fundamental change? Um, I think that uh, when the curriculum was developed in the late 80s, it, it was a good move. I think there'd been a lot of um, haphazard curriculum yes. work, some brilliant work and some very, very poor work, as history shows. Um, what the national curriculum did was make sure there was an entitlement for children, whether they lived in Berwick or Bodmin, Birmingham or Billericay, they got an entitlement. Uh, whether that meant that overall the teaching for young people got better yes. and whether the learning therefore improved is open to doubt and there's lots of debate about that from academics. And if you think about the late 80s, Yes. If you looked at pictures of the late 80s, uh, life in, the, in that time, and compared it to now, you would see massive change. Yes. And we have to say, what in the curriculum needs to change to take account of that? In 1988, the, the internet hadn't been invented. It, it's amazing, isn't the it? The internet began in 1991, yeah. it's 15, it's in year 10. Yeah. Right? And, it, it, and we've got to take account of that in a really positive way in the work we do with schools. Not be frightened of it. We're not mm. frightened of books. They've been mm. around for a long while. You know, children have access mm. to books and we think it's a wonderful thing. They also have access to knowledge and information through the internet that we should be able to capitalise on and make sense of. Since 1988, the number of people coming into this country from different places yes. across the world 
has brought a rich diversity in our population that wasn't there at that time. There was diversity, but not, not the breadth of diversity that we see now. And, and we've got to just make the curriculum fit the needs of the future for our young people, while still recognising that they are children and teenagers growing up and they need an enjoyable time in school and elsewhere. That's true. Interestingly, one of the, the things, the, the impressions I got when I was looking at the curriculum reforms of this year for Key Stage 3 is that I felt for the first time that the emphasis was about structure of the curriculum, yeah. more so than, yeah. than content. Yeah. So you've not launched, you didn't launch a review of uh, the, you know, the, the, the schemes or anything yeah. like that. It was almost as though you'd said, look, you know, we, we don't want to keep giving up heave on the content, but we do think it could be structured in yeah. a slightly different way. The initial uh, request from government was to look at the programmes of study and try to slim down the content. And what we've tried to do is take out what I call low-level clutter. Right this obsession with small detail and asking teachers to make sure that every child in the country uh, knows a certain fact or a certain piece of information. Uh, but the programmes of study are only the ingredients. They're, they're the ingredients sure. of the meal. And the real challenge, I believe, is in the design of the curriculum so that it matters in individual schools to the children that are being taught. And I think it's the design that's as important as the ingredients. I think that's what makes this particular curriculum review different than mm. different than yeah, previous ones right. and it'd be interesting to see how it goes there's also an element that when i read through sort of the examples you, you that were being given yeah. there's a bit of me that said well hang on this isn't new you know this isn't a brand new idea that mm. you know there are schools who do this i mean ever i suppose <coughs> if i was being hypercritical i think I, I might ask you come on is this a rebrand i mean yeah getting rid of low-level clutter isn't very radical, it's not a big change. Mm. Some of these things are, are happening already. How big an idea is it? Is, a, is it a good rebrand of what's existing? And there's nothing wrong in that to mm. focus attention. Mm. Or is it really fundamental change that you're asking your schools? Um, it's a bit of all of those things. Uh, first of all, it, it's, it, it's not a massive change. What we've done is taken out a lot of the clutter and given teachers the and schools the opportunity to structure a curriculum that matters to them. In the end it's down to well what can we do to make this curriculum come alive for children mm. and be such a magnet they can't pull away from it. And there are many schools in this country that are doing absolutely amazing curriculum work and what we've tried to do is identify those schools and work with them to identify what it is that's making their curriculum work and why it is that their curriculum has caught fire. One of the ways in the curriculum review, you've talked about rebuilding the, the structure mm. of the curriculum, is a, a greater emphasis on cross-curricular work or interdisciplinary work, but that's not entirely new either. I mean, we've, we've done that before as well, possibly when you and I started mm. teaching, and it got the impression then of being a bit wishy-washy, of mm. missing things out, of being a bit lax, mm. of lacking rigour. So why is it different now when you talk about cross-curricular work now, why was it different than it was in the 70s? Yeah. I think what we're finding in the schools that are uh, carrying out the pilot work for us is that uh, the main difference is the level of rigour in what the children are doing and the way the, the application of one subject with another. Uh, and it's cre creating these contexts for learning, which is so absolutely vital. Employers tell us that they want to see soft skills develop, yes. they want to see teamwork, yes. they want to see children who um, can use ideas in a creative way that are adaptable, flexible, support each other. Now, if we're going to deliver those things for employers, as well as the functional skills, we've got to give children real context in which yes. to learn. So we've tried to say that within the context of the curriculum, the youngsters should be engaged in an activity within their own community where they could restore a, an area of recreational land or they could build a bird hide or they could... Um, do something which was uh, gathering a survey for a local mm. political issue. But they actually get involved in it in a way that has relevance to the community. Another aspect is where we're suggesting and we're seeing in our pilot schools teachers from subject disciplines yeah. helping each other to make relevance to youngsters mm. and how do they fit together. Now it's, it's not about saying there's got to be projects and themes where we all gather around and do word association and think whether, um, whether we can think of yet another thing that sounds vaguely linked, but it is about saying what can we fit together in the way in which the programmes of study are offered mm. to the youngsters 
to make them realise that there is a link between the learning that they do in different areas. Does that does it change the status of the subject in school? Do you think? I suppose in the in the 90s there was a bit of a pressure to build up the importance of subjects yeah. like you know, the literacy yeah. hour, the numeracy <laughs> yeah. hour, and nothing else should yeah, you right. should be taught during that hour almost. Yeah. Is this yeah. is this a shift away from the from the power of subject yeah. knowledge? No, I think subject knowledge is absolutely basic. Without knowledge, you can't develop skills. You need, you need knowledge to have skills. So it's not skills or knowledge, it's both. Subjects are important. I think the challenge is to, to balance the need for um, a sort of focus on the content of the subject in terms to the power, in, uh, in towards um, the power of the subject discipline. And I think we've got to get over to youngsters. Uh, the real enjoyment of being mm. a scientist, or what is it in the thinking of a historian that makes them different from the way in mm. which geographers might think, or the way in which mm. an artist might think. Mm. And we've got to do some work which is about helping children uh, to learn what a specialism is, and how you develop a yes. specialism. A specialism, specialism isn't what you're left with when you've failed everything else. Mm. And too many children think that's what it is. It, that's, what you've described is, is quite complicated for teachers, isn't it? I mean, Ironically, and I think it's a big issue here, it's what primary schools do all the time, but we make this decision that by, by secondary we go into specialist teachers teaching. And I'm just thinking, as we've been talking, mm. about the science teacher or the English mm. teacher who's not only got all the pressures they've got yeah. as teachers, yeah. but have now got to work more closely together. Mm. It's not going to be easy for them, is it? No. Um, what we're finding in the uh, pilot schools, case study yeah. schools, is that where, the, where they're looking at uh, working together from different disciplines, there's a real enthusiasm and a real excitement about what's possible. And many, many teachers are really enthusiastic about this chance so to... So it's given them an extra yeah, breath of life, really. You know, a bit of a boost, really. Yeah. Because the way we go around in schools is, is very interesting. Do you have to go Velcro together because you're all mathematicians? And yeah. You, the maths know, corner. Yeah, and, and <laughs> do the PE lot have to walk around mm. sort of holding hands all the time because they are the PE lot? Mm. Department is mm. a fascinating term. It means you depart from the central core and, and we ought to be coming together over learning mm. and but really it, it exploiting what's possible. Another thing I think might be feared by parents sometimes is you, you're not talking about, are you, that PE teachers can teach maths or English teachers can teach history. I uh, mean, they, it's it's not a. I mean, it's not a way of getting around the fact we've not got no. enough maths teachers or physics teachers or oh, certainly not. anything like no, that. No, no, it's certainly not that. But it, nevertheless, the case that what we don't want teachers saying is, uh, I can't help you with maths, you with maths because I'm a PE teacher. We want teachers helping children in every subject all the time, and at some times saying, I don't know about that. But let's all go <laughs> ask the maths teacher or the art teacher or the science teacher what it is that we can take forward. Um, I, I just think there's a lot to do on getting our children to look beyond the key stage they're in and look mm. leapfrog a few key stages. Mm. So um, many, many young children, some of those from the, shall we say, the more deprived backgrounds that we were talking about yes. earlier, uh, many children don't know what you can study at university. Yes. They think you have to carry on doing those subjects for the national curriculum at university mm. because they mm. don't know about others. And somewhere in Key Stage 3, we should be taking that opportunity to say, you've had that lovely primary experience, and all this lays in front of you, the yeah. world of work, the world of further and higher education. And these are some of the things that people do in that world. So if you want to go towards those yeah. things, here are the ways in which it's you can It's the final that stage step. before they make choices at 14, isn't it? That's right. And mm. sometimes the choices are built on very, very shaky mm. uh, ground because the children haven't had that mm. width of experience to know what what the choice yeah. is about. I mean, you describe it as getting rid of the clutter. Yeah. That's one thing. But yeah. the minute you've got this flexibility mm. and you're saying to teachers, you know, make decisions yourselves, you've got mm. two risks, I suppose. One is that children miss out again. Mm. And, you know, the old story of the good yeah. English, they can yeah. do English all day. Yeah. Or second, at the very least, it's difficult to monitor what each, what each child has done. I mean, mm. the, the, the present structure of 40 minutes of this, 40 minutes of that might have many weaknesses and it has. Mm. But at least you know which subjects each child has covered. I and mean, know they may not have done it effectively. Yeah. Is that a worry that you might be moving along the road of freedom yeah. and you might clash in yeah. and take away entitlement? Yeah, the, the, the present structure of 40 minutes followed by 40 minutes by, by 40 minutes at least tells you what you've delivered. Yes. What it doesn't tell you is whether what they've got learned. it. Yes. And, 
I think we've got to take a, a step that says, what is the best way to put this together? So going back to my sort of analogy of yeah. the ingredients, if you imagine you've come back from the market with all the ingredients from a lovely salad and you've got some tomatoes and some cucumbers, some lettuce, some onions, some sweet corn, some mushrooms and so on. What we currently do is we say, we'll have 40 minutes of tomatoes, then yeah. a bell will ring, and you get 40 minutes of cucumber, then after a 15 minute yeah. break, you settle down to double onions. Yeah. And I'm not sure that's the best way to enjoy a salad. Now, yeah. some parts of it, are ah, right on their own. Sometimes you just crunch on the tomato and it's good. And that will be that that will still be the case. Absolutely. Sometimes there's a need to teach Absolutely. a subject separately. Absolutely. And many times there's a need to yes. teach a subject separately. Mm. The challenge is the rigour with which we teach it. So children dig deep and they really understand that period of history or they mm. really understand the learning about that location in history. Yeah. But the in the curriculum that we proposed, uh, every subject starts with what are the big ideas? Yes. in this subject. What are the important things that children need to learn during Key Stage 3? And I think that's more important than did they know this fact, did they know that date, can they recall it? Do you sometimes feel like um, poacher turned gamekeeper? Because I, I reckon if you said to teachers, what is it that stopped you innovating in the curriculum? Yeah. Why haven't you um, taken these risks? Mm. QCA would be one of the organisations yeah, yeah, which right. they yeah, cited yeah, yeah, and yeah, said, right. well, I, I couldn't because of the curriculum. So to me, it's quite a, it, a clever in the nicest sense mm. of the word. It's quite a clever and a difficult um, trick you're trying to pull off that QCA is going to be the great liberator now rather mm. than the great restrictor of innovation. Oh, well, I think that's a good point. Um, is that how you're positioning yourself? Yeah, I, I mean, the QCA is fascinating organisation uh, and the word authority on the end of it is a fast, uh, you know, interesting one to explore. If you're an authority, you can get your authority by telling people what yeah. they have to do, yeah. or you can get your authority by building credibility, building uh, in people a trust about what you're trying to develop and being the conjurer of innovation. And I think our challenge is to get people to believe sufficiently in the curriculum that they can make it work for their youngsters. I, I do believe that over the years we've stopped talking about the curriculum where mm, we've talked mm. all the time about the national curriculum. Mm. I mean, I'm director That's of curriculum. I, it is the curriculum authority yes. for the nation. We are not the national curriculum authority. Yes. We are the curriculum authority for well, the nation. Subtle difference. And over years, QCA has been drawn into conversation endlessly about the national curriculum and not the bigger curriculum. curriculum yeah. um, I, I was going to ask you that, but how much were you bearing in mind the, the move potentially to keep all 16 to 19 year olds in education and training? Because I, I can't make up my mind whether that's a big change or not, to, to tell you the truth, because it's not keeping them in school, but it's part of what you're doing with the younger years of secondary. Mm. Do you have in mind the fact that within a few years we could have everybody under the age of 18 in educational training? Yes, and that, that, I, I think that's the point I was making earlier uh, about uh, throughout the school system, we have to give youngsters a picture of pathways that, they might, uh, that are available mm. to them uh, to take them into work, into further education, mm. into training, into higher education. And that can start way back in nursery. I've got mm. some brilliant examples of people working in nurseries talking about the world of work for children. Sure. And it's that picture of pathways that are available rather than which pathway is the best for you yet. Let's keep talking about possibilities and where we might go. I wanted to talk a bit about qualifications because I think there's still a... I suppose we've got into the habit of national tests and results there yeah. and the rest of it. Because I still think there's a bit of lack of clarity about what the proposals are here. The minute you start giving people freedom yeah. uh, to do things, it means that assessment has to have that flexibility mm. as well. Now, alongside your work, we've got the proposals from the government that somehow will loosen up on the key stage tests. Mm. Um, the changes you're making, what changes will need to happen in assessment? In the in secondary or, review. In, in, in the secondary review, in order for your mm, curriculum to yeah. really get hold of schools. I mean, if you look at some of the ways we, um, we test children, yeah. um, they're not exactly modern in the sense that uh, they're part of our tradition and there are other options available. And I think what uh, the government are doing is thinking about the other options and the progress testing uh, development is, is a, a step towards seeing whether we can... Uh, be more effective in our assessment, but at the same time maintain the confidence of parents yeah. and community. I mean, Ken Boston, the chief executive yeah. of the QCA, suggested you do that by testing a sample of children at well, those key stages yeah. rather than 
every single child, mm -hmm. sort of, to give yeah. you that national yeah. picture. But one of the challenges in assessment is that we're using the endocrine stage test for lots of purposes. That's right. And what Ken's talking about is uh, the purpose, which is to measure standards over time, could be met on a sampling basis. Mm -hmm. That doesn't meet the uh, challenge of helping teachers to provide the right instruction, the right techniques for their children tomorrow as a result of the assessment that's done today. Do you have to make the teachers less nervous about the assessment and all yeah, that accountability yeah. framework? Well, what, what we know is that it's not the assessment, it's the accountability it's the account frame, the, framework what, and what, what happens afterwards. What in the public afterwards. domain and the league tables. Yeah. Yeah. Now, my experience in Manchester and, both, and Birmingham was that um, the worry about weak results led to a narrowing of the curriculum and we had to basically in both places talk about is that what we want for our children and we decided we we're going to give in both those places children a rich experience yes. an experience that mattered and we were going to make learning real and when we did that the basic results went up anyway mm. so mm. if you look at the at the profile of achievement in, uh, of attainment in those two cities they rose dramatically while the curriculum was made broad and mm. rich and interesting for young people. So it's not one or the other, but many, many schools think it is. I do understand the worry. Right. I really understand it. But, so, but some have the confidence to go beyond that yeah. and take the risks. It's yeah, about giving the rest that confidence. I'm not sure it's a risk, though. I think the risk is... I think um, I agree with you. They, yeah. they feel it's a risk. Yeah, it's, yeah. The, it's the interval between yeah. doing this and showing that it's working yeah. is the worry because... Yeah. If, if something dreadful happens in that period, we're all accountable. Yeah. It's the accountability framework that is actually at the heart of some of the worries. So, you know, when a child gets to 13 and does its key stage three SATs, um, three key stage three assessments, uh, it has only previously been tested that's nationally exa once. That's exactly right. Right, yeah, so it's not exactly overburdened exactly right. with testing. Yeah. But it's what happens to the testing yeah. that worries teachers. I have to say, some of the words you're using in this new curriculum flummox me. I mean, mm, no, curriculum sorry. lenses, curriculum oh, yeah, dimensions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. what's the point of using phrases like that, that are just something else to learn? And, you know, yeah. I, I should think parents have just about got used to key yeah. stage yeah. one, yeah. two, three, and four, and now you're plonking this other language. And I think my question really is, you know, the curriculum is one of those areas of education that gets laden down with oh, specialist yeah. language. Yeah. And I, you've done a little bit more of it. We, are you aware of that? Or is it language for the profession oh, only? Oh, the jargon. The, the jargon, jargon, the jargon. Yeah. Well, every profession has its jargon, doesn't it? And uh, we have to live with that. I think uh, there's the balance to be played between using jargon and trying to, make, trying to make things accessible. The word lenses came about because we were trying to say there's more than one way of looking at the curriculum. I see. And how should we look at it? We can look through different, different lenses. lenses. Right. And you might look for, uh, in designing your curriculum. You may start from the subjects and say, let's design with a subject basis. But you could use the lens of the Every Child Matters agenda. Yes. So if you're a school that needs to focus really heavily on children's health prospects because they really matter. Maybe if you looked at the curriculum through the lens of health, mm, mm. you would see some uh, ways forward mm. that hadn't been appropriate before. So our efforts on the lenses was just simply a way of saying, here's a different way of looking at the curriculum. So it's um, a tool for teachers more a than a new terminology in curriculum. It's not new terminology. It's just a, a, a way of helping people through the design process and we are trying to produce the curriculum as a web -based, uh, on a web-based format so that they, uh, anybody logging on can find their way through the design process uh, mm. by using these lenses yes. as starting points. So I doubt many people in uh, the world beyond schooling would want to do that. They're very welcome yes. to. It'll be a public uh, website. Okay. New words come along all the time. Well, I've, I've learned it in preparing for this interview, so, so there you are. It's become part of my yeah, language as well. Right, yeah. uh, I, 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 just take things broad. I mean, you, I don't suppose when you started off as a, a young teacher, you dreamt for a minute you'd end up, you know, uh, being director of the curriculum for the nation rather than the national no, no, it's lovely, isn't rather it? than national <laughs> curriculum, the director yeah. of curriculum for the nation. And you've, you know, you've not just been an administrator, you, you have been a, a classroom teacher. Mm. Looking back and looking forward, how important is the curriculum? What's the power of the curriculum? Mm. It's your everyday mm. job now, and there's a, there's a danger when that happens, that you give it in your own mind more importance than it's got. Where, where do you slot it in? Not in terms of hierarchy, but what's it special in? What does it mm. offer that nothing else mm. can? And you know, how important is it? So if you say, where's the curriculum fit? I think it's very near the front of yes. what matters. Those schools that think hard about the curriculum achieve more for children. 
absolutely sure about that. Uh, in front of it, I would probably put the quality of teaching uh, because I can offer you the ingredients, but unless you can talk them out, well, what can we do? And then there are all those other things, that ability to relate to parents and community, that ability to make children think they can do this, um, that ability to make children think learning's worth it, meaning that the quality of teaching is also about the quality mm. of relationships, that ability to make people wonder and mm. make people mm. think and make people question. And when you see adults who are really learning still and want to know more, mm. then you've got an image to show children about what it can offer and what it can open mm. for them. So I think uh, the curriculum really matters. It's, it's, it's about the only job I but would have done But it's not standalone, it can't survive uh, mm. without the other things Curriculum on it. its own won't get anywhere, anyway, will it? Yeah. <laughs> It'll just rot. And and success, you've got to bring it to life yeah. and you've got to Success do somehow things, is yeah. getting all those things in the yeah. same place at the same time. So I think my job is, uh, at QCA and QCA's job is to um, create professional contagion around the curriculum, create um, a sort of national enthusiasm for this thing. Mm. So that we do, as we said at the beginning, as we, so that we do look back as, as a country at what we've done for our youngsters and say that was worth it and aren't we proud of it and shouldn't we delight in the way our youngsters are developing. Mick Waters, thank you very much indeed. You're welcome.